what I'm going to talk about tonight is, uh, or introduce you to, uh, is, is the concept of volcanoes in our backyard and uh, what are the volcanoes that are, uh, that are out there that are kind of fun, what are the ones that we need to worry about a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and what, one of the things I hope that you leave with tonight is a sense of what are the, the hazards associated with volcanoes in general, but also particularly in our neck of the woods. And uh, that's uh, because it's a really good thing to know what um, is out there that could potentially harm you, not just in terms of volcanoes, but also in terms of earthquakes and tsunamis and landslides and the like. And uh, once you're, I find for myself, once I'm educated about the hazards, I feel actually a lot better about uh, going somewhere like, say, the coast over by Seaside and knowing that there's a tsunami that, that's a, a danger out there and sort of having a, in my mind a, a plan what I would do. So that's like sort of one of the goals I, for, for myself tonight is to, is to have you have a better sense of the kinds of things that can happen at volcanoes. <clears throat> what this just shows is that we have volcanoes around here that have erupted in the last 10,000 years. And um, these volcanoes include things uh, that are well known like Mount St. Helens, Crater Lake, Glacier Peak up in Washington, which is perhaps not very well known. It's the second most uh, explosive volcano in the Cascades next to Mount St. Helens. And then uh, volcanoes uh, out here, um, like Diamond, Diamond Craters, which is uh, probably a place that uh, most folks have never, have never visited. And uh, then there's this little stretch in Oregon um, that has a lot of volcanoes. And it's one of the few places in the world that you can go to and have a 10-volcano day. That's one of my ideas of, of paradise. <laughs> so this is a picture taken from a vantage point uh, fairly close to, to Redmond. And, um, there are nine of the volcanoes going from Mount Bachelor on the south, on the left-hand side, up to, uh, to Mount Hood on the right-hand side. And what I'm not including in here is Newberry, which you could see from this vantage point off to the left, and, uh, and Mount Adams uh, off to the right. So um, this is a great place. And there's not many places in the world where you can, you can see something like this. Um, so all this kind of to, oh, and ah, one, more, one more thing to say is that also we have in Portland volcanoes. <clears throat> and uh, Portland is the only major U.S. city that has volcanoes inside its urban boundary. And uh, this map here shows all the red dots that you can hopefully see. Yep, all the red dots there. Uh, those are vents that have produced uh, eruptions over the last two and a half million years. And the most recent one was Beacon Rock back about 57,000 years ago or so. And this is actually fairly new science uh, done by Russ, uh, Russ Everts of the USGS. And um, these go off about every 50,000 years. So that's not something that you really have to worry about in your lifetime or your children's lifetime, or you, know, you can extend that onwards. Um, but it's still kind of cool. And uh, I don't have to show you pictures of this, but I just wanted to put up CVO's local volcano. This is our uh, volcano that's closest to us, Green Mountain. Um, which we can see from the observatory. So um, it's no wonder that we have all these fantastically named beers that are out there. And I, I want to say that my putting these up here does not imply any kind of endorsement by the government or by myself. And just to illustrate that, there's one beer I've not put up here, which is that one. And since it's not being produced anymore, I can say that that is the worst beer I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so with all these volcanoes, the next sort of question is, why are they here? And uh, I'm just going to go through this very briefly just to uh, give sort of a sense of, of, of why, this is, why this is happening, why this is the case. Um, and the, the, the two-word answer is plate tectonics. And uh, this map, this figure up here shows all the black dots are earthquakes and all of the red triangles that are a little bit hard to see are uh, volcanoes. And one thing that you can see from this map is that they're not located everywhere. They appear to define the edges of something that looks like jigsaw puzzle pieces. And uh, so that's the basic idea behind plate tectonics is that the, uh, the crust of the Earth is made up of a series of plates that are shaped kind of like jigsaw puzzle pieces. And they move around relative to each other. On the inside of the plates, everything is fine, everything's stable, no earthquakes to speak of, uh, very few volcanoes to speak of. But on the margins, that's where all the action is. And uh, 
this is just a diagram showing how the plates are moving relative to each other. Here we are, up here, this is a little sliver of the Juan de Fuca plate, which is the trivia question and answer. And uh, the North American plate's moving that way, the Juan de Fuca plate is moving that way. And just to go over the sort of three basic ways that the plates can move, they can move apart from each other, that's called a divergent boundary, and in that kind of situation you tend to get um, uh, uh, fairly fluid lava coming out, um, not a lot of earthquakes. Iceland is a place where there's a divergent boundary that's producing a lot of eruptions, a lot of, uh, a lot of lava. Um, then you also, the second thing is they can slide by each other, and that's called a transform plate boundary. And that's very much like what we have going on down in California with the San Andreas Fault. And that's a situation where you tend to get lots of earthquakes. Some of them can be quite big, magnitude eight-ish, thereabouts, um, but no, no volcanoes to speak of. And then the third kind of boundary is where they collide and that's called a convergent boundary. And that's what we have off our coast. And uh, when they collide, the two plates uh, have a little debate. And the debate is, um, am I denser or are you denser? And the one that's denser goes down, and the one that's not dense stays up. So it's good to be light. And uh, when the plate is going down, <clears throat> some of the water that's in that plate uh, gets uh, sort of evaporated away or heated, and uh, it moves up into the, uh, into the um, overlying plate, and that's where magma is generated, and magma being less dense than the surrounding rock, it rises and, and erupts, if we're lucky. Um, we also get big earthquakes in that situation, and that's the big one off our coast, as well as um, smaller earthquakes that happen um, at, at, uh, above this plate boundary, um, including things like the Scotts Mills earthquake in 1993, which we can expect to have happen around here probably every 30 or 40 or 50 years. Um, <clears throat> so, in a nutshell, that's why we have volcanoes here is that we've got a subducting plate under our feet, and it's giving rise to magma coming up uh, um, at, uh, at, at the volcanic centers. And this is a, uh, a map showing the Pacific Ocean, and uh, all of the red triangles are uh, volcanoes that are considered to have the potential to erupt again. There's 169 triangles on this map, and about 90 of them are in Alaska, and Alaska also has a subduction zone, so it's a similar kind of reason. Uh, and the Alaska Volcano Observatory is in charge of those volcanoes. Uh, here we are at CVO, and we have the Cascades. <clears throat> and then there's also Long Valley Observatory, which uh, operates uh, down in California. And the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory in Hawaii operate kind of the two exceptions of plate tectonics, which are hotspots. And I'm not going to go into why there are hotspots. That's a whole different talk. <clears throat> but um, that's sort of the, 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 the stage is set for... Uh, why we have volcanoes around here and, and sort of why the USGS Volcano Observatory System is set up the way it is. Okay, so what volcanoes might erupt? And uh, I've already shown you part of that with this map that shows the triangles. And I've said that these are volcanoes that have erupted in the last 10,000 years. That's one rubric. Um, but uh, the mo mo most important thing to do is um, to go out and actually look at the rocks. And this is what geologists have been doing around here for the last, since the 1970s or even earlier, is uh, going out and uh, <clears throat> walking around uh, upstream valleys, digging trenches, um, hacking away at rocks, to try and piece together the story that each volcano uh, has put, put, put out there in the rocks um, and to tell us how frequently volcan those volcanoes erupt, what kind of eruption they take, and uh, sort of what's the likelihood of an eruption happening in the future. And all of this is based upon the uh, sort of underlying statement that guides a lot of geologic thinking, which is that what's happened in the past is our guide to what's most likely to happen in the future. So um, th thanks to, uh, entirely to, to the geologic work, we have this kind of graphic that shows there are 13 volcanoes, at least right now, that we think have the potential to erupt again in the future, potentially in our lifetimes. And uh, what this graphic is showing on the right-hand side, it's a little bit fuzzy, but this says 4,000 years to zero. So here's the present. This is where we are right now, going back 4,000 years. And uh, the idea is that going back to 4,000 years, that's about the time when we start losing some resolution in the geologic rec record, and we aren't as confident about our ability to say, yeah, there was an eruption here, or no, there wasn't an eruption there, because things like erosion remove rocks. Um, so each of these triangle icons corresponds to a time when there was some sort of eruptive activity. 
at the Volcanic Center, and you can just sort of look at that and say, well, Mount St. Helens is the clear winner. Um, the sort of the cool thing about this is that when I came down to the Cascades Volcano Observatory in 2003, this was what that graphic looked like. This was back in two, uh, sort of 2000. This reflected 2000 science. And um, if you rank these just based on counting the number of icons on there, um, this is how it falls out. Mount St. Helens is number one, Glacier Peak two, and then you go down to California for three and four, and then up to Mount Rainier for number five. The intervening uh, decade or so um, has changed that order. Most, and particularly, what we know a lot more now about is Mount Rainier, and that there are a lot of small eruptions that happened, particularly between 2000 and 3000 years ago, um, that significantly changed the eruption rate, our understanding of the eruption rate. And so just purely by this one metric, um, Mount Rainier is the second most likely uh, volcano to erupt. If you assume that volcanoes behave in a linear way, which they don't, but that's just <coughs> the simplest thing to do. <coughs> another, uh, another way of um, thinking about this, talking about this, is looking at the long-term odds for large eruptions at Cascade Volcanic Center. So this is not just looking at whether or not they erupt, because a lot of the eruptions that were on that previous graphic, the little explosions that put out just a little thin layer. But this is looking at eruptions that are at least um, a tenth the size of Mount St. Helens, a tenth of a cubic kilometer. Mount St. Helens put out roughly about a cubic kilometer. And uh, so um, if you look at that over here on the right-hand side, this is the percent chance in a year that we will get an eruption that will produce a tenth of a cubic kilometer at any one of these volcanic centers. And the first thing you can see is that these are really small numbers. This is 0.8% chance that Mount St. Helens is the highest one. And that's based on what it's done over the last 500 years. Um, <coughs> and uh, you can go down, down the list and, and look at Mount Hood. And at least from this perspective, the chances are really, really small. It's a, that's a thousandth of a percent chance, which means you have to live here for a thousand years to have that go up to 1% um, chance. <coughs> so that's, you have to live here a long time to see Mount Hood produce an eruption that's a tenth the size of Mount St. Helens. In terms of the stuff that comes out, again, this is not sort of evaluating hazard or risk. This is just looking at one particular part of it. What's the volcano that's most likely to produce a pretty big eruption? And clearly from these numbers, Mount St. Helens is, uh, is, is that one. Um, a final statement is that in the Cascades, on average, over the last several hundred to thousand years, if you look at the number of eruptions that we can uh, count of any size, it averages out to about two a century. And over the last couple centuries, that's about what we've had. We had uh, Mount St. Helens eruption in 2004, 2008. And then going back into the 20th century, we had Mount St. Helens 1980 to 86. And then Lassen Peak, that was another trivia question, 1914 to 1917. Then going into the 19th century, we had a couple of eruptions at Mount St. Helens. And then Mount Hood back in 1790 was the third, third uh, Cascade volcano, third most recent Cascade volcano to have an eruption. Um, so we've had one this century, and if you want to believe in these kinds of, of, of numbers, then we're due one more between now and 20, 2100. Um, but volcanoes don't usually behave linearly, and we can't take that to the bank. Okay, so um, now volcano hazards. So this is uh, going to transition the talk over into talking about what volcanoes can do, what kinds of things they can produce. And a hazard is something that is bad, it's, or potentially bad, something that will cause damage, uh, will um, hurt, um, or destroy some, 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 some part of an, uh, of a, of an area. And um, I'm, 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 here I'm subdividing hazards in terms of distance, which makes a lot of sense because the hazards are going to be a lot different if you're close than if they're, you're far away. So. Um, uh, the first grouping here is what I'm, gonna call, I'm calling proximal. And uh, proximal just means near, within about 15 miles, although that also depends on the volcano. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, in, in those situations, you have uh, usually minutes to tens of minutes to deal with something if something happens at a volcano to get out of the way. Between 15 and 100 miles uh, away, you've got tens of minutes to hours. And generally speaking, in that situation, you're dealing with things like lahars, which are these uh, uh, long-traveled mud flows that I'll talk about in a minute, and significant amount of ash, <clears throat> which can cause a problem for things like buildings uh, collapsing. 
And then the third category is uh, distal hazards. That's uh, greater than 100 miles out. We're really are mainly talking about ash hazards. Um, and then a, a final comment down here at the bottom is that um, if you have a fairly significant eruption that produces a lot of ash, you have a lot of sediment that's gone out into the drainages, and it can take decades for that sediment to work its way through the drainages and have the drainages become stable again. And so in th that case, you have a very long-lasting hazard that can, uh, can impact wasabi for a long time. So I'm going to go through each one of those and, and uh, talk a, a, about, about a few examples. Um, so with, uh, with proximal hazards, you're thinking about things like pyroclastic flows, ballistics, um, lava flows. And uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a, of a, um, <clears throat> a hazard map for Mount Hood. I've put in a red circle there that uh, shows, roughly speaking, the proximal uh, zone for Mount Hood. And the problem with Mount Hood um, is that there's nothing from the vent that's going to stop anything that comes out of that vent from moving down the slopes of the volcano until you get to Highway 26, Government Camp, and Highway 35. So um, you just don't have any barriers. So if you have any kind of small little pyroclastic flow or, uh, or some ballistics that could cause rocks to start bouncing down, um, or even potentially lava flows, um, there's uh, an area around there where people live Government camp is, is a year-round um, <coughs> year community, um, and you've got the ski areas, which are year-round businesses, and you have Highway 26, which is a major east-west uh, thoroughfare. Um, those are places that are not going to be good places to be if Mount Hood were to wake up again, even for really, really small eruptions that don't produce this sort of tenth of a cubic kilometer thing. It can be very, very small and still have uh, a major impact in terms of not these places not being good places to be. Um, and so uh, here are some of the issues. Usually 30, uh, to 30 minutes or less of, of warning time. Um, usually that's too short for us to be able to detect and correctly interpret and give warning and for people who get that warning to take action if you're in the proximal zone. So this is where things like establishing a red zone, an evacuation zone around a volcano, when it becomes restless, comes into play. This is where sort of in essence we're saying this is a place where we can't give enough warning to get you out of the way, so don't, don't go in there. But of course, there's all kinds of issues you can think of um, if government camp is in that zone. What happens there, and how long do they stay in evacuation mode? And evacuations are very, very painful things to live through. And if you're in an evacuation mode for months or years, that can be um, really, really hard. So there's some very tough societal issues in, uh, in, in this area. And along with that, officials often face very difficult decisions because of that, things like evacuations and limiting access and, and, uh, and whatnot. Um, oops. And uh, uh, I'm going to talk about St. Helens a little bit later on. But um, that was an acute issue for Mount St. Helens in 1980. And uh, uh, because of the way that that eruption played out in the first couple of months, uh, people got very restless about being kept away from the volcano um, for, for understandable reasons. Um, this is a, a little case history of a, of a proximal uh, issue for a volcano community in Iceland. And this is one of my favorite eruptions because I was seven when it happened, and there was some great National Geographic coverage of this wonderful pictures that came out. And I was cutting them out and putting them in my my, uh, my book. And um, the next year, my parents wanted to go to England, and I really didn't want to go to England. And they said, "Well, we'll go to England." Um, Will, it, will you let us go to England if we stop in Iceland? And I said, yeah. And so we got to go out there a year after this happened, and that was just, that was, that was I, but send me on the road to where I'm at right now. At, at right now. Um, so this eruption began about 1 o'clock in the morning in January, which is a dark time in Iceland. It's oftentimes very stormy. There was no warning, partly because there was no modern-day monitoring network out there, because it wasn't modern back then. It was 1973. Um, and... Uh, the um, people felt earthquakes and, uh, and heard sounds, and an evacuation happened in the middle of the night, and uh, people got out by fishing boat, and about 5,000 people left by morning, which is just an amazing thing when, when you think about what's involved in, in getting people out of a, a place. And um, the issue with this volcano, with this eruption, was that there was a lava flow. Not, nothing big, no big explosions, but there was a lava flow, and it was going through the town, and it was also going across their harbor. And this is a little bit of a dark image, but there's a harbor right here, which was the reason, the economic reason for the existence of this village, <clears throat> still is. 
And so their, their issue was this lava flow was going right across the mouth of the harbor, and it was going to close it off. And so what they did was they got out a bunch of fire hoses, and they sprayed water on the front of the lava flow. They did that here in this town, uh, in, the, in the streets. This is, these are, this is a little narrow alleyway with lava marching down it. They had a whole bunch of fire hoses on that, and they had boats out in the harbor spraying water on the front. And the idea was to try and chill it enough that they'd get a little barrier that would stop the lava from moving across the harbor. And they were successful, which is one of the few examples out there where people have really been able to mitigate, to stop a volcanic hazard in, in process. Um, instead, however, what happened was that the lava flow took a detour and went through town. And so <laughs> they, there were some houses lost, but in balance, if that harbor had been cut off, that would have been almost game over for that community. Um, another example of proximal hazard, this, this one is more speaks to the warning issue. Um, this is from Mount St. Helens. This is a seismic record uh, from a station that's 70 kilometers away. And you read these seismic records left to right and top to bottom like a book. Each one of these little tick marks is a minute mark. <coughs> and um, what I'm going to show here, this is, uh, this is the uh, start of the eruption right here. And what I hope I don't have to convince you of is that before this eruption, there was an earthquake here, there was an earthquake there, there was an earthquake there, earthquake there not really anything spectacularly pointing to 8.32 in the morning was when it was going to happen. And, um, <clears throat> and, that, and that's what happened. And um, the issue there is, and, and I should say that uh, you know, the, the, the hope of everybody who was involved in monitoring back in 1980 was that there would be some warning and that there would be some ability to say, hey, get out of the way. And uh, I know my, my former advisor, uh, Steve Malone, who was up at the University of Washington at the time, he was the primary seismologist working on this. He felt horrible after this happened, just absolutely horrible. People died, and he felt like they mess, missed something. And people have gone over these records decades. I did it when I was a grad student. It's like, oh, come on, you must have missed something. <clears throat> and there is absolutely nothing you can point to that would tell you from the seismic record alone that it was going to happen then. Yes, it was unre in unrest. Yes, we were having lots of earthquakes. But there was nothing that was going to tell you that it was going to happen then. And so this is, again, the reason why there's this red zone, is that volcanoes don't always have a nice linear playbook that tells you when something is going to happen and impact the area right next to the volcano. <coughs> and then a final example. This is something that's relevant for people who, like, like, uh, like me who work uh, on volcanoes and work sometimes inside volcanoes. This is a uh, couple of uh, photograph sequence from Mount St. Helens, 2005. And this is taken from a remote camera that we had operating, kind of like a web camera, uh, that was looking into the crater of Mount St. Helens. So along here on the side, for those of you who are familiar with Mount St. Helens, this is the southwest uh, crater wall, wrapping around to the south side. And then this is the 1980-86 lava dome. And over here is the new lava dome that was being erupted back in 2004-2008. This was taken at uh, 5.24 p.m. on March 8th. And the next couple of, of photographs are about a minute and a half, two minutes apart. <coughs> and so just to flip back and forth, that's 17.24, that's, uh, sorry, 5.24 p.m., 5.25 p.m., and that's 5.27 p.m. <coughs> and then I keep on flipping, that's 5.30 p.m., and that's 5.33 p.m. So I'm going to go back now and um, look at this area right in here. This is a snow patch on the north side of, a, of the old lava dome. And right about in there, I don't know if you can see these, the little white dots that pop up in the snow, those are, um, can you see those? Okay. Those are impact craters. Those are ballistics landing on the snow field. And uh, the, it, ballistics are, you know, anywhere between a half a foot, a couple feet across. And uh, those would have killed anybody who was out there and, and, uh, and met with this. Um, at the OMSI uh, uh, natural disaster thing, there is a seismic station on display there that was located right here. And <clears throat> it got shredded. And that's the thing that's on display now is the shredded seismic station. Um, but that's just sort of an illustration. And this is the place where um, we, we were working. People were, were on, on, on the ground not this time, but um, a couple weeks earlier than this. 
and uh, where we also uh, have, have worked uh, since then. So um, there was very little warning of this. There was a very subtle change in seismic activity, but not enough for us to be able to say anything about it, save like what was going to happen, and then it just sort of happened. So for people who are working in the, in the, in the, uh, in the proximal area, this is uh, also something that we always keep in mind. <clears throat> okay, so um, turning next to things that can happen more further afield, lahars are one of the uh, really big damaging things that volcanoes do. It's sort of counterintuitive. You think of volcanoes blowing up and, and doing big spectacular things. But what they, what, one of the things that they do that's really damaging is, is uh, they produce a lot of mud, a lot of ash, and the stuff goes a long ways. Um, so this is uh, a slide showing a <clears throat> lahar that came out of a uh, fairly narrow channel that came from a volcano called Naval de Ruiz in Colombia in 1985. And it went through the town of Armero in, uh, in the night and killed over 20,000 people. Um, this was, for everybody involved in volcanology, you know, not only a tragedy, but it was just sort of, uh, it, it, was, it was, along with 1980, 1985, sort of two marker eruptions in terms of uh, realizing what our job really was. In this case, the issue uh, was there were scientists there that were working on monitoring, and uh, there was uh, conversations with the public and with emergency officials, but what really happened was a breakdown in the chain of communication. And then when it came time for actually an eruption did, did, uh, did occur that caused this lahar, but warning ultimately never got down to the people who were in this village. And they didn't evacuate, didn't, some people didn't know, and a lot of people died. So um, <clears throat> that, that's a, a huge tragedy. Um, this is a picture of Mount Rainier, taken from roughly the same vantage point as the, uh, as the previous slide. And um, what I'm showing here is uh, the uh, town of Ording, which is located at the confluence of the Tuolup and the, uh, and the Carbon River. And um, about 500 years ago, there was a similar size, actually much bigger lahar, that uh, came down the valley uh, from Mount Rainier uh, and uh, got here in about a half hour and completely filled up the valley. And it turns out there have been a couple of these that have come through this particular area, uh, most notably one in 50, about 5,600 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, this would be absolutely devastating if it were to happen today. So Ording is the first major town that's in the way, but then it continues on to Sumner, continues on to Tuolup, and if it's big enough, on to Tacoma. And one of these, the Osceola mud flow made it all the way out to, to Seattle. Um, and when you see things like this, you start thinking about things like land use planning and stuff like that. Um, there's some big societal questions here. If something only happens every 500 to 1,000 years, it's expensive to engineer uh, for something like this. So does society put in money to deal with this or not? And the, uh, um, the answer is still up in the air. Um, so here for Mount Hood, uh, turning for, again locally, uh, there's a, a lahar hazard. Um, if Mount, uh, Mount Hood were to erupt again, it would do probably a lot like what it did in 1790, uh, which was a fairly small lava dome building eruption <coughs> with some rock and ash falls that went down into the government camp area and also produced some lahars. And what this map shows is uh, estimates for time, how long it would take for a, a significant lahar caused by an eruption out of Crater Rock to get down to places like Zigzag and on into Sandy. So it'd be about two hours to Sandy, half hour to Zigzag, and out to Troutdale, about three and a half hours. And uh, so that gives you a sort of sense of timing. Um, and then this little brown area up here is a delta that, was, uh, that has been built out um, from the Sandy, and that's a result of the reworking of all of the debris that came out of the eruption, of, out of the Mount Hood eruption, um, and worked its way through the drainage system over the next several decades and formed this delta, and the delta has, among other things, made the uh, Columbia do a kink and uh, moved it over towards Camas, which is where I come from, so thanks, Mount Hood. Um, so the, the main thing to say about, about, uh, about, Mount, about lahars is that um, <clears throat> they can travel a long distance, but they can also last a long time. The hazard can last a long time, much, much longer than the eruption itself. And just as one example of this is Mount St. Helens, um, which had some tremendously large lahars that went down the Tula River drainage. And um, that actually was one of the, that, that, um, next to people being in the proximal zone, this was the thing that killed people, uh, were, were these lahars. 
And in addition to the, uh, in, uh, on top of the Laharge, there was uh, a fair amount of pyroclastic flow activity and also a large landslide. And all that stuff came into a couple of river valleys, including the Tool River. And all that sediment is now being exposed to moisture, to, to rain, and is washing down the Tootle. And anytime you have a, a, a sediment clogged drainage system, that drainage system starts to move around a whole lot. And the erosive power of that drainage system is much greater. And it becomes very hard to be a community living along the side of that river when the channel is just um, going all, all over the place. And so what's uh, been done at Mount St. Helens is the Army Corps of Engineers has constructed something that's called the sediment retention structure dam. And this was built, finally, uh, the construction was finalized in 1987. And it's still a very, very important part of the hazard mitigation strategy for, uh, for the Tootle River. And the idea is uh, it's causing this area of spill water that allows the fine sediments to settle out. And then some of the spill water spills over the dam and continues on with much less sediment than it otherwise would have and much less erosive power. Um, so if this structure weren't there, it'd be hard to be uh, in Castle Rock and having a community built along the side of it. And also a lot of sediment would be going into the Columbia River and causing uh, issues with navigation and much more frequent need for doing dredging. Um, so this is almost well, 25 years after the fact, uh, in terms of well, more than 30 years after the eruption, 25 years after the fact of the, of the construction of this. This is still an issue that's going to be with us for decades at, uh, at Mount St. Helens. OK, um, and then ash is the final hazard I want to talk about. Um, ash is really nasty. It gets into lots of things. And this electronified world, it gets into things that really, really don't like ash and will break very easily. Computers, HVAC, um, the like. So uh, I'm showing here is a, a, a jet that was, uh, um, uh, this looks really bad. It was actually just sort of hanging around and got loaded up with ash in the Philippines. Um, but uh, ash and airplanes really, really don't, don't uh, mesh well. And the ash will get into engines and cause them to stop. It will get into hydraulic lines and cause them to clog up. And it will sandblast all of the exterior paint and all of the windows. And there's been a number of many instances, actually, of, of planes flying inadvertently into ash clouds and losing uh, engine power. And uh, even if they don't lose engine power, they fly through ash clouds and they experience a lot of uh, uh, sandblasting, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix. So um, that's one of the major, uh, major hazards associated with volcanism, um, in addition to things like cars, where if you uh, want to drive through an ash-laden road, you better have pantyhose on your air intake to, uh, to filter all that out. Um, ash, because of, uh, of it, it, uh, particularly because of the vulnerability of aircraft to ash hazards, um, it has the, 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 the ash production of volcanoes is the uh, longest distributed hazard. We don't have to be anywhere near an active volcano to be impacted by it. Uh, and an illustration of that is for us here in Portland was the 2009 eruption in Mount Redoubt. And uh, Mount Redoubt's you know, 1,000 miles plus away. And uh, it produced an eruption in uh, uh, the erupting in 2009, finally had a couple of explosions that put ash over into Anchorage and closed the Anchorage airport for a, a couple of days. And uh, that did two things. It grounded some planes that were already at the airport, but also planes that were coming from Portland and Seattle couldn't go up there. So there are a number of closures that happened here and uh, be both because planes couldn't go up to Anchorage and because planes were up in Anchorage and they couldn't come down here. And so at least for a couple of days, we here were, were locally influenced. And anybody who remembers reading through the, uh, the IFIA Yokel um, Icelandic uh, eruption in 2010 that shut down European airspace for a couple of days, that was a major, major, major uh, economic impact and, and a big deal. <clears throat> so here, this is sort of the trivia question uh, for, for Ash. Um, in our local area. We're right there where that red circle is. And this is a map showing the annual probability, so multiply these numbers by 100 to get percent, um, of an, a centimeter of tephra fall, which is about a half an inch. So I know the trivia question said four inches, um, but uh, this, is, this is a slightly different map. And uh, what you can see is that there's, there's a little red dot here for Mount St. Helens, which is where there is a 1% annual probability or annual 1% uh, chance of there being one centimeter of ash fall right next to Mount St. Helens. And then this next pink loop out here is 0.2% uh, 
chance, annual probability. So multiply that by 100, and there's a 20% chance if you live to be 100 that out here you would experience one centimeter of ash fall. And uh, that goes out to uh, Portland, where here we are at two, I don't think I can do that in my head, um, two hundredths of a percent chance of a centimeter in a year. So multiply that by 100, and you're looking at about 2% chance in 100 years, if you live to be 100, that we would have a centimeter of ash in Portland. And that's actually about right when you think about it, because back in 1980, we actually did get some ash here in Portland from Mount St. Helens. On May 24th, there was an eruption, and the winds were blowing from the north, and we got it down here. That's an unusual trajectory for us. And a lot of what this reflects is, uh, is well, it reflects Mount St. Helens is the most explosive volcano, and also winds are going west to east, usually. Okay, so enough with hazards. There are volcanoes in our midst that might erupt at any time. What can we do about it? And this is where we start talking about risk and the distinction between risk and hazard. So a hazard is something that can happen, but if you have a hazardous volcano that's located on Mars, there's not really an issue <clears throat> unless we care about Mars, if there's some sort of economic reason. Similarly, if you have a, uh, a system that's very, uh, uh, very vulnerable, uh, very valuable, like, say, uh, New York, no, Bo no, Fenway Park, Fenway Park. Um, there's no volcano near Fenway Park. So it's, it's, uh, even though it's vulnerable, it's not exposed to any hazard, any volcano hazard, and so there is no risk there either way. So what th this diagram shows is you have to have an intersection between vulnerability and, uh, and the hazard to have something that's, that, that you have to worry about. So um, when you think about vulnerability, we're characterizing things like population that might be, ex that might be exposed, economic value, uh, cultural value, ecological value. And then once you've established that there's risk, <clears throat> then that's when you start thinking about things like mitigation, response, preparing, and recovery. So um, one of the things that uh, we've done at the, U at the USGS uh, Volcano Hazards Program is uh, gone through and done a, what we call a threat assessment, which is another word for risk assessment, of all the 169 volcanoes in the United States. And this is partly uh, for us uh, to have a way to prioritize what volcanoes we can devote our limited resources to in terms of uh, mitigation strategies and monitoring and things like that. Um, and so uh, this list here shows the 18 volcanoes that came through this assessment uh, as being ranked as very high threat, the highest threat uh, volcanoes that we have. And you'll recognize some names here, perhaps from Kilauea, St. Helens, Mauna Loa, um, the most important thing I'll point out, at least for, for us here, is that uh, 10 of those 18 are Cascade volcanoes. And uh, two of them are in California, four of them are in Oregon, four of them are in Washington. So these are the volcanoes that we really, really, really need to spend some time thinking about how we're going to be mitigating, because here is where we think that the risk is highest. And this is where we're taking into account not just explosivity, likelihood of eruption, but we're also taking into account people and infrastructure and air traffic. And those two factors are getting merged together to produce this list. So getting back to this first diagram, um, <clears throat> the colored triangles that I said I would explain before, um, now they're sort of explained. The red triangles are the ones that are the very highest threat. And those are the ones that we need to pay most attention to. The uh, green ones out here, the blue ones out here, there's not a lot of exposure, and there's also not a lot of likelihood that those are going to erupt. So those are sort of down on the list of volcanoes that we need to worry about. So um, now that there's a risk assessment, and I should say a risk assessment is something that you can you sort of continuously do. It's not a fixed number or a fixed answer. Things change partly because society changes. People move in closer to volcanoes. That changes, that changes the risk uh, quite a bit, uh, as well as our understanding of volcanoes. Um, so once you have the assessment, then you start getting into things like land use planning, uh, emergency response planning, community education, which is sort of what's going on here, and monitoring and research. And that's the last bullet, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk. And um, there's been a lot of slides, a lot of static slides that aren't moving. So I thought that we'd all take a breather. And, um, 
<coughs> this grainy video shows a geologist, John Palliser, going up to the uh, erupting lava dome of Mount St. Helens. This is back in 2004. And he is um, collecting a, uh, a rock sample. I'll do that again, this time maybe with sound. There we go. So this sound is the helicopter. And uh, there he goes, walking up, and then he starts whacking away at it. I love this. I love this. And, and, and what he's doing, this is actually a form of monitoring, he's getting a rock sample. And one of the things that we never know when we have a, a eruption is we don't know what the magma is like when it's coming up. We don't know the composition. Um, and in this case, it, the, the rock looked a little weird. And uh, what we learned from his sampling efforts was that that was all fault gouge. Um, and uh, he also got some chemistry on, on that. This isn't something that, generally speaking, uh, is done a whole lot. But um, that this was something that was, that was deemed important enough to, to warrant uh, <coughs> getting that close and personal. So uh, back to the static slides. Um, <coughs> so in terms of monitoring, what we're doing is we're kind of like doctors in that we are um, reading the signs and symptoms of, uh, of a volcano. And we're using those signs and symptoms to try and come up with a diagnosis. And um, that's actually a pretty darn good analogy, except that we have a much harder time actually getting at the patient. Because the patient is down here. This is the magma that we're interested in trying to understand. We're trying to figure out what's this magma going to do. Is it going to stay there? Is it going to come up? And if it's going to come up, what's, you know, is it going to blow up? Is it going to give a long lasting eruption? Or is it just going to kind of uh, do a lava flow and, and call it good? Um, so all that we have to go on are what we're able to measure at the surface. And uh, at least until it comes out. Once it comes out, then we can start doing things like what uh, our, uh, my colleague is doing up there. So uh, we have um, earthquakes that are caused when magma moves. It breaks rock, forces rock aside, and it will break rock and it will cause earthquake. It will also uh, deform the ground. Um, <clears throat> it will sort of shoulder aside so if it's not breaking it, it will move it away. And you'll see deformation at the surface. Um, there's also gas coming off of this, uh, uh, off of the magma, and depending on how open the conduit is, you might see some of that coming out ahead of time and, and see some signs of magmatic gas. Um, and then there also might be heat coming off of that, heating of the ground, and uh, that will, um, <clears throat> that's something you can potentially measure. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we're targeting when we're doing monitoring. And the goal is to diagnose the patient. Um, the bottom line is that all volcanoes give some kind of warning before they erupt, which is actually really nice. You can't say that about earthquakes. Earthquakes just happen. Um, but volcanoes give some warning. And um, <clears throat> they can sometimes give warning for, for, for a long time. But it's our job to be able to detect the warning signs and correctly interpret them. So here's one of the challenges in doing all this. <clears throat> Um, is that volcanoes don't always play nice. They don't have follow a nice linear playbook. So here's uh, one plot that shows some measure of unrest. Let's call it numbers of earthquakes per unit time, earthquake counts. So we've got uh, a situation where we have a lot more earthquakes occurring. Uh, sort of it, they're, they're increasing. The rate of earthquakes is increasing. And uh, that's, that's going with time. So here we hit this point where uh, it looks like it's, you know, it's lasted long enough and it's uh, increasing at something like a scary rate, and it's decision time. The public official has to make some kind of call about what to do. And uh, this is where the problem comes in in terms of how volcanoes behave, because what they do do is all of these things. They can go straight up to an eruption, it's nice linear behavior, you can call it right and, and, uh, and, and get an evacuation going and, and, uh, and, and everything is good. You can also get it sort of hanging fire for a little while and then ramping up to an eruption. You can also get them ramping up and then ramping back down and going back to sleep. And you can get them ramping up and hanging fire and then going back to sleep. These two things we call failed eruptions. And um, that's not so much from the perspective of what the magma wants to do, but from our perspective, um, the risk here is in calling for an eruption or forecasting an eruption and then not having it happen. And what this really speaks to is the difficulty in this is that we have to get it right. We have to call 
an eruption uh, with a forecast if it's going to lead an eruption or if it's not going to lead an eruption. If you do the reverse, so if we say there's not going to be an eruption and it happens, that's bad. And likewise, if we say there's going to be eruptions and there isn't, that's bad too because we trigger unnecessary evacuation and that uh, society has a really hard time with evacuations that don't need to happen. <clears throat> um, another issue, another challenge, is that volcanoes wake up with variable amounts of time. This is a graphic uh, showing uh, sort of uh, percent of volcanoes in um, the Smithsonian uh, volcano database that have taken less than one day, one to seven days, eight to 31 days, one to six months, six to 12 months, and on up to years, uh, between the first signs of unrest and eruption. And I'm just highlighting three cases over here. Mount St. Helens in 1980 took two months from the first eruption, first earthquake to May 18. Um, a volcano in Colombia took 19 months. And uh, the worst case scenario from all of our perspectives is a volcano called Akmak in Alaska in 2008, which had 1.5 hours of warning. And uh, no joke, it went, it was, that's the first earthquake, it was one and a half hours. <clears throat> So um, this is uh, a rationale for why you want to have monitoring instruments in place ahead of time, because you just don't know how fast these things are going to wake up. There's some statistics that you can use to say, yeah, this kind of volcano is probably going to erupt or wake up quicker than this kind of volcano, but really you can't be 100% sure. So when we monitor, um, these are the kinds of instruments, these are really generic pictures, of, of the kinds of things that we're looking for. So we're looking uh, at seismometers for monitoring seismicity. We're looking at um, uh, things like GPS receivers for monitoring deformation. We've got uh, the need to measure temperature um, and also uh, measure gas. We do things with airplanes and with satellites to look at deformation and also uh, ash clouds and any kind of thermal anomalies. And then we also have uh, um, things that we call acoustic flow monitors that are looking at river valleys to detect floods. And uh, <clears throat> here's some pictures of our instrumentation. This is a, a GPS, so there's a GPS dome here and there's a seismometer that you can't see buried under the ground there. Uh, this is one of our newest stations that we installed at Newberry last summer, 2011. And uh, this is what a seismometer looks like. About th many of them are about the size of a, of a soda can. Um, very, very sensitive. Uh, here is one of these acoustic flow monitors at Mount St. Helens that is uh, um, watching one of the streams that comes out of, out of Mount St. Helens. And then this finally is a, a, a spider, <clears throat> what we call a spider. This is something that we uh, designed at CVO to deal with the issue at Mount St. Helens in 2004 that we wanted to be close to the vent to monitor it, but it was dangerous. And so this, uh, this equipment, um, we could sling out by helicopter and we were in harm's way for five minutes and, uh, and then got good data after that. This is uh, my favorite station that we've ever done. And uh, there's somebody in the audience here, uh, Dave Sherrod, who was involved in installing this and in maintaining it. Um, I didn't allow myself to go up there because I'm not a mountaineer and this is only accessible by helicopter and the evacuation routes are over, uh, over glacier routes. Um, but this is at 11,000 feet at Mount Rainier. And this, is, uh, this was installed in 2008 to um, specifically to address the hazard of, of lahar generation at Mount Rainier by uh, large landslides that uh, could potentially come out of the Sunset Amphitheater. And that's what that station looks like. Um, so it's a, it's a real spectacular place. And it has GPS and uh, a seismic station, a, seis a seismometer buried over here, and also has the tilt meter. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna finish up by showing two examples from the Cascades of uh, monitoring in action. And I'm gonna primarily focus on seismicity because I'm a seismologist, it's what I know. Um, <clears throat> also because it's earthquakes, I'm biased, but I think that earthquakes are uh, the easiest thing to work with sometimes in terms of understanding what's happening at a volcano, if you had to pick one thing. Always wanna use multiple things, but if you pick one thing, earthquakes are pretty good. So um, I've, I've used the word we a lot, um, and I'm gonna continue doing that. And in these examples, I also wanna acknowledge that the way things work in Washington and Oregon is that uh, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, whom I'm guessing many of you probably are somewhat familiar with, they're the folks that do the earthquake locations and magnitude for Washington and Oregon. They actually have the responsibility of doing that for earthquakes of magnitude five and below. 
and that includes all the earthquakes at, Mount, uh, at, at volcanoes. So we work with them very, very closely. And uh, when I say we, that's, that's who I mean, them and us. <clears throat> okay, so the first for, uh, monitoring example is a situation that we had developed pretty rapidly at Mount Rainier in uh, September of 2009, September 20th. This is a uh, seismic record. Again, you read these left to right, top to bottom. The colors are just for your eye. There's no significance to the color lines, except that it's easier to see the lines. And uh, this is a 12-hour plot from a station that's high up on Mount Rainier. And uh, the swarm starts right at that arrow over there with a first little earthquake, a uh, little dinky guy um, that really wouldn't have caught anybody's attention except in retrospect. Um, the action really got moving uh, here around 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Of course, these things always happen on Sunday. And um, this is a magnitude 2.3, which turned out to be the largest event in the swarm. But it went fairly rapidly from there. And all told, there were about 1,000 earthquakes that happened over a three-day period, which is a lot. For Mount Rainier, we've never seen anything like that. And, uh, um, and yet we didn't do anything in terms of a formal uh, statement or a formal change of alert level. And uh, I'm going to show you why that was. Um, first off, just to show you where these earthquakes were located, so here's the summit of Mount Rainier. Uh, these blue dots correspond to locations of earthquakes that have uh, occurred over the last 20 years. So this is sort of the normal place that earthquakes locate at Mount Rainier. And I should say that these were all around sea level, which is about uh, a mile or so below the base of Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is built up fairly high on, uh, on, some, on some old rock that's not part of Mount Rainier. So these earthquakes aren't actually happening in Mount Rainier, in the volcano. They're happening below it. And these red dots um, are the earthquake locations for the 2009 swarm. And those uh, were in sort of a new place. They kind of filled in a hole between those blue dots and those blue dots. But they sort of also were in the same kind of area. So that was part of the reason why we didn't pull the trigger and, and do anything. Um, <clears throat> And uh, this is how the swarm played out. So remember that curve I showed before where there was this little exponential thing and that decision point? So sort of that decision point was right there, but it, uh, potentially, but it died off pretty rapidly after that. And the swarm continued on for a couple of days, but this is really where the main action was. And so we were sort of watching it and seeing if it was going to do anything else before deciding to do something. And again, this is where part of the issue is that Mount Rainier, um, people pay attention to Mount Rainier. A lot of folks up in the, or in the, uh, the Puyallup River Valley know about the Lahar issue. And if we were to issue an information statement, that might cause more alarm than is warranted. And so we sort of have to balance these, uh, these, these things when we're thinking about what to say about these kinds of events in terms of formal, formal pronouncements. What we did instead was we posted events on, well, the events are always posted on the, on the websites, but we also posted some interpretive language that describe what was happening, and we put them in our weekly update, received your weekly update, and uh, <clears throat> didn't, didn't go beyond that. Um, so they sort of happened in a normal area. Um, another reason why we didn't really uh, worry about it or didn't, didn't react, I'm going to say the word didn't overreact, is because uh, we had a model of uh, how the earthquakes, of, of explaining why the earthquakes at Mount Rainier were happening in the first place not the ones in 2009, but the ones that have been happening up until then. And that model comes from a fair amount of research that uh, folks like myself um, and a number of other people at the University of Washington and the USGS have done over the last several decades to come up with this kind of a picture where we think that way below Mount Rainier, there's an area where there's a lot of hot rock. There's, you know, Mount Rainier is 500,000 years old. There's been a lot of magma that's come through the system. And there's a general rule of thumb that <coughs> um, about 10% of the magma that is intruded into the crust actually erupts out, and the other 90% stays behind. And so one idea that we have from Mount Rainier is that this area down below is a place where the 90% has stayed, not the 99%, but the 90% has stayed uh, down low. And uh, coming off of this, it's sort of cooling very slowly, and there's some fluids that are coming out of here. Uh, fluids meaning water and, <clears throat> and maybe a little bit of magmatic stuff. And those are coming up. And uh, where they're hitting this area, we're getting earthquakes. They continue up to the surface. And at the surface of Mount Rainier, at the very tippity top, there are boiling point fumaroles that do have some magmatic gases in them. 
So there's some evidence that puts this all together. So um, our vision of the earthquakes that occur at Mount Rainier at these depths is that there's no magma involved. This is something that's more related to fluid circulation, a fairly benign process. And this is where the 2009 earthquakes occurred, roughly the same place. Yes, there were a lot more of them. Yes, they happened pretty quickly. But um, we still kind of felt that we had a bead on why they were occurring and that it had nothing to do with magma. And that's why we didn't ultimately do anything. And uh, this is, I'm going to flash through these because I think I'm going a little long. Um, <clears throat> so just one thing I want to sort of take home message from this is that this is where the world of research interacts with monitoring. And research is, one of the outcomes of research is that we develop models to explain the behavior of volcanoes and explain how volcanoes work. And those models, in turn, help us out tremendously when we've got a situation of unrest. And we have, if we have a model that's been tested, that's got some good basis for it, um, then that gives us something to interpret unrest in, a context to interpret unrest in. So in the situation of Mount Rainier, we already had sort of had an idea of why the earthquakes were occurring. If we didn't have that model, there would be a lot more uncertainty, would have been a lot more uncertainty about how we would have interpreted that swarm. And we might have acted a little bit differently, perhaps sounded the alarm bell a little bit earlier and maybe provoked a little bit of unnecessary angsting. So the last example is uh, Mount St. Helens. And uh, this is one where we have a lot of data and uh, there's some cool things that, that we saw there. So I'm going to close up with um, some interesting stuff, I hope. Um, so set the stage for the eruption in 2004. I'm going to walk you through how we responded to the volcano waking up. And uh, this plot here shows depth versus time going from 1980 out to 2006. All these circles are individual earthquakes that have been located by the University of Washington. And uh, this green box here, this first one over here, shows the time period when Mount St. Helens was erupting, 1980 to 86. Produced uh, 20 lava dome building eruptions in that time period. And then in 1986, it quit. And from 86 onwards to 2004, we had nothing. Um, no, no eruptions. But you can see we had a lot of earthquakes. And um, this is one of the things that Mount St. Helens is the most seismically active volcano in the Cascades. It gets, on average, two or three um, a week, something like that. And um, you can see we had a lot of interesting earthquakes uh, uh, shortly after it quit erupting. And then for this time period between about 1999 onward to 2004, there really wasn't any hint that there was going to be an eruption. Just kind of steady as she goes, uh, a couple of, couple earthquakes a day, and uh, a week. Actually, no, a couple earthquakes a day, and uh, and and, uh, and not much to worry about until it erupted. So here's what the first uh, earthquakes looked like on September 23rd, which is when the arrest started at two, in 2004. Um, first earthquake was uh, 2 o'clock in the morning on September 23rd. Um, I came into work around 7, and uh, 7 o'clock was right around here. So at that point, we could see that we had a swarm going on. Now, Mount St. Helens is more seismically active than Mount Rainier, and it's had swarms in its past, so this isn't entirely unusual. So we just watched it, and watched it through the next day. We saw the swarm getting more, uh, more pronounced. Uh, at this point, we issued an information statement saying, there's something going on. We don't necessarily think it's going anywhere, but there's definitely something going on. Um, and then on the 25th, you can see it actually started ramping down. And one of the reasons why we didn't immediately go again to it's going to erupt is because we'd seen this before at Mount St. Helens. This is a two-day swarm on November 3rd, November 4th, 2001. And these, again, are these uh, left to right diagrams. This is 24 hours. And you can see the swarm starting off. Um, and kind of building up and dying down, building up, dying down, building up, dying down, until it finally, finally quit. So um, one of the things that we do when we're looking at monitoring is we're looking for unusual activity, which means we have to have a pretty good idea of what's usual. And at Mount St. Helens, the answer is a lot, a lot is actually pretty usual. And so um, <clears throat> when we first were faced with this, it didn't seem like it was tremendously out of the ordinary. And right about in here, this was a, on a Saturday, um, I was at home, and I was thinking that it was all going to be done. And I remember the moment I was out mowing my lawn on an afternoon, beautiful sunny afternoon, and I got a call from, from Steve Malone from the University of Washington. And he said, you know, I think they're getting bigger. And <clears throat> I also think that they look a little different. 
And so I um, stopped mowing the lawn. I went in and told my wife, you know, if this goes somewhere, I'm not going to see you very much for the next couple of weeks. And, uh, and that was really true. So here's what continued, uh, what happened. It actually did pick up, and uh, we had an intensification. And at this point, this was something that we had not seen before. And uh, pretty clearly at that point, we mo knew we were moving in a direction uh, that could very easily lead us to a new eruption. So here's that change. This is what we, the kind of earthquakes that we were seeing um, in the first couple of days. This is what they looked like. This is a sort of a normal earthquake. We call these volcanic, volcanic tectonic earthquakes. This is what we call a volcanic earthquake. And uh, it just means something that you don't see anywhere else except for volcanoes. And usually they're associated with gas or with, um, with uh, some kind of eruption, uh, explosion or uh, magma moving. So um, this is a new station, new plot, um, but the same kind of thing. Here's September 24th. Here's the initial ramp up, then it came down, then it started ramping back up, bigger earthquakes. And then you can see over sort of like every 24 to 36 hours, there was a step in terms of numbers of earthquakes and sizes of earthquakes. And by the time we got down to here on September 30th, we were getting magnitude twos and threes about every minute, which was really intense and very hard to deal with. So on the right-hand side over here, um, kind of the chronology for our response. So when it changed from, uh, <coughs> started, it went out of this lull and went into an intensification, we went to yellow. And yellow is on our, we have a four color alert level scheme, green, yellow, orange, and red. Uh, there's no five uh, blue, I think, is the Homeland Security thing. Um, so we, uh, yellow just means something's happening. It's unusual. We don't know if it's going to erupt, but it's unusual, more unusual than an information statement. Orange means it's really unusual, and there's a pretty good chance this is going to go somewhere. And then red means it's going somewhere, and we think it's going to go there right now, um, or pretty, pretty soon. So we went to yellow, and this is on a, on a, on a Sunday. Sunday afternoon, and we issued the initial uh, release, and we were sort of expecting some, some media, and nothing really happened. But <clears throat> Monday morning, it was uh, pretty incredible. This is actually isn't Monday morning. That's a dark slide, but uh, this is a couple days later. But this is my our office, and uh, these are satellite trucks. And this is uh, three days after we went to yellow, and the satellite trucks were there all the time afterwards, uh, after we went to yellow. And uh, we all also were having press briefings in our office a couple times a day. And uh, as things got more intense, we started being carried live on CNN and, e uh, not ESPN, but uh, Fox News. <laughs> <coughs> um, I, I wish. And um, so uh, this sort of, th this, was, this was crazy. And a lot of us had never dreamed that we would live through anything like this. Um, but it was also you know, a very, uh, very intense period of time when we were doing real-time science and it mattered. And I think that for a lot of us, that was really uh, a really a powerful thing. Um, so this all built up to October 1st. And uh, actually, yeah, one of the things I want to show you before we move on to what happened on October 1st is another sign of the craziness. So um, this is a, a slide I took uh, from um, a vantage point out on the volcano, looking backwards. And for those of you who have been out there, that's the Johnson Ridge Observatory. Um, so you know sort of how big that is. And that's a normal thing for us to see. But when we got to this place, we looked over here and saw these things too. And we were like, well, what are those? Did they look like houses, like a new housing development that built out there? But it turned out that they were satellite trucks. <laughs> <coughs> and this is where Geraldo camped out. And he was there for a couple nights, which is... Yeah. Um, and then um, this is a picture taken by one of, the, uh, one of my colleagues at CBO. Um, when we were leaving the field at the end of the day and coming in the, in the morning, uh, for, for a couple of days anyway, there were people lined up along the road both sides for miles. Um, and folks were out there with like hibachis in their pickup trucks. And a couple people uh, reported driving out and we had government tabs on our, on our, on our, on our trucks. And uh, people were going, yay, which is uh, next to this, the only time that any of us are going to feel like rock stars. <laughs> so that's, that's, the stage is set. That's how things were October 1st. And uh, we also started seeing some ground cracks on, on the glacier outside of the, of the lava dome, which let us know that there's something moving upwards. 
Um, and this all culminated on October 1st with our first explosion. I'm just going to show you this video and hope that's going to pop up. There's no sound in this. Um, when this explosion happened, we had a helicopter flying in the air that had a visual and thermal infrared camera. So phenomenal timing, and they were able to catch the beginning of this. And um, <coughs> just for reference, this is the 1980-86 lava dome. Back here, this is the south crater rim wall, and the vent is just on the south side of the dome. And uh, you can see some ballistics coming out. And uh, right where this white cloud is, red cloud is, uh, is a uh, seismic station that didn't last. <coughs> and um, yeah, uh, so pr pretty intense. And that was this was about noon. And I have a private story to tell about this explosion, which is not not one that I'm good involved in getting my wife really really panicked for about a half hour. Um, and there we go. So this is where we were on that uh, that that day. We were out installing a station. Um, <clears throat> and we were in a place where we had sort of deemed it was safe. Four kilometers away, we didn't think anything really big was going to happen. Um, but our protocol was if anything weird did happen, we were going to evacuate. And so this picture shows the initial cloud coming off of that explosion. And uh, here are all of us getting ready to evacuate. And <clears throat> you know, it was okay. Um, this is the part my wife didn't know about. And uh, so she was, uh, she was a little worried. And this is that seismic station. Um, before and after, and uh, so proximal zone, not a good place to be. <clears throat> so um, continuing the narrative, uh, after the explosion, the earthquakes quit. There was complete silence, and that was actually how we knew about the explosion where I was, because we had a radio scanner on. We were listening to one of our seismic stations. You can hear it kind of go boing, 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 and then we didn't hear anything. So we looked up, and there was the cloud. So the earthquakes quit. That's a little weird. And um, there's two questions. Are, is it done? Or is this the quiet before the storm? And uh, it turned out it was the quiet before the storm, um, at least in terms of the seismic uh, story. Um, this was uh, the next day was uh, the most intense seismicity. We were getting twos and threes every minute. Uh, this is when most of the seismic energy that was associated with this eruption was, was expended. It all culminated in this um, really uh, nondescript blue thing, which uh, was very large seismic tremor that we saw hundreds of kilometers away. And uh, that was when we went to red. And uh, unfortunately, no explosion happened. And the red means something big's going to happen. And nothing actually big ever did happen. Uh, it all kind of culminated in um, the last explosion on October 5th, which looked like that. This wasn't sort of what everybody had in mind. They had in mind sort of more of the 1980 Plinian thing that went straight up. And uh, after this, the earthquakes really quit, and this was kind of when the media lost interest. And, um, and yet we had an eruption that lasted for three and a half years, three and a quarter years uh, uh, after this phase. So just to sort of summarize some of the things, the vent clearing phase lasted about two weeks, really intense um, media public interest for two weeks. One of the interesting things was that from our perspective, it took eight days to go from the first earthquake to the first explosion, 2004. In 1980, it took seven days to go from the first earthquake to the first explosion. So maybe that's what Mount St. Helens does. Um, there were thousands of earthquakes a day, tremendously challenging to deal with. And uh, information age brought with it the expectation of 24-7 data availability, availability, interpretations, and news. And the entertaining thing to think about was that this was before YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and the iPhone. So um, the next time this happens, there's no reason to expect that the pressure and the expectations aren't going to be, you know, a lot more. Um, <clears throat> so for the rest of the eruption, it lasted from October 2004 to January 2008. And here's some cool things we saw. So these are some pictures that were taken, that are, that are pictures that are made from topographic maps that are generated using uh, topography. And uh, I'm not going to explain it too much, but th these look like satellite pictures. That's what they're meant to look like, but they're not really satellite pictures. And what I'm going to do is walk through these. This first one starts September 1986. This is the stage before, actually after the last eruption. Um, here we are in 2004. So one of the things that happened between 86 and 2004 was a glacier had built into the crater. And then there's October 4th. That's the first dome, the first sign that something is coming out. Uh, October 11th, October 13th, October, November 4th. And I'm just going to keep on moving through these. Um, now we're in 2005, 
and here comes the second spine. It's about to hit the wall, breaks up. Here comes the third spine. We're July 14th, 2005, so a little, little less than a year. And activity is focused now over here. And one of the things you can see is that these glacier lobes have started moving a little bit. <coughs> They're, the ice has been pushed aside and it's starting to flow downwards. And uh, there's 2005, there's 2005, 2006, and I think that's the last one. Nope, one more. And uh, one of the things that's happened since then is that these two lobes of the glacier have met in the middle and have started moving out, uh, out towards the end of the uh, edge of the dome. This is the fastest moving glacier, fastest advancing glacier, I think, in uh, the United States. A second cool thing was that we saw, with that kind of eruption, very regular eruption, we saw very regular earthquakes, so regular that we started calling them drum beats. And uh, this is a, a, a plot that shows uh, from November 9th through November 17th, so that's 12, 13 days, each one of these lines is a little earthquake, and there's thousands of earthquakes in that plot. And uh, what I've done here is I've created an audio file out of an hour of that and sped it up by a factor of 60 so you can hear the earthquakes, and it'll last about a minute. sort of like somebody that's learning to dance and not quite getting it, but they're pretty close. That's, that's neat. So it went along like that for, day, for actually months, months and months. And that's not something that you usually see with earthquakes in particular. Earthquakes are usually sort of more, more random, but just in nature. Nature doesn't usually behave in such a regular way. And it was a, a real fascinating, still is actually a fascinating thing to try and explain what was actually going on there. The last thing I'm going to show you is a sequence of photographs from a camera that was installed in uh, 2006 um, that was taking pictures um, about every hour uh, from this vantage point called Brutus, looking uh, west across the crater, uh, across the, uh, the, the, the new dome. And this is the uh, vantage point. And um, <coughs> so this is the top of the spine I can see, I don't think you can see. But um, so uh, what I'm going to show you, this is the date down here, August 2, 2006, 2010. I'm going to show you daily uh, slots. So the next, next, uh, next uh, slide is going to be October, uh, August 3rd. And uh, I'm going to page back and forth. And what you should be able to see is the dome moving, which is, this is cool. <laughs> so the next thing that's cool is I want pay, you to pay attention to that patch. So this is still August 3rd, and we go August 4th. So it's, that patch is moving, and then August 5th to August 4th, it's stuck. So this is something that people think uh, happens before earthquakes. You get something stuck, and then it pops, and you get an earthquake. So. August 5th, August 6th, August, all of a sudden that patch is moving again. So I'm going to go back, August 4th, August 5th stuck, August 6th moving. So now I'm going to go back, full sequence, August 3rd, August 4th moving, August 5th stuck. There was an earthquake five minutes after that picture was taken. That was big, it was a 3.3. And uh, this is about the right size for a fault that would produce that kind of an, uh, that kind of an earthquake. But the real thing about this, you can play earthquake prediction and see if you can see if you can be right. So I did this, um, and so here we are, August sixth, and then August seventh, August eighth, it's stuck. So August sixth, seventh, it's moving. August seventh to eighth, it's stuck. So um, I, I don't like to toot my own horn, but every once in a while you gotta, and um, I put this entry into the CBO log, this is an earthquake prediction. So not a forecast, a prediction. A prediction involves a time, a place, and a size in order for it to be at all useful. And so people who say they can predict earthquakes, a lot of times what they're doing is sort of doing very general areas and very general sizes. And um, it's easy in some cases to get it to work. You say, I'm going to predict there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow in the world. Say, well, okay, that's good. So. Um, 
in order for it to be really useful, you have to be able to do it as specific as you can be, where, when, and how big. So that's what this is. This is a where, not St. Helens, um, shallow. That's just a little added uh, bonus. Um, magnitude 3.3, and it's going to happen before 1.10 p.m. tomorrow. I don't know why I, I was so brazen about that. <coughs> but um, I put it in at, at 4 p.m., and <coughs> then I was down at the uh, Indian restaurant down here on, on Hawthorne when I got an alarm, and it was that earthquake. And it was that earthquake at 8 o'clock um, on my wife's birthday. Um, so this is the only time that's ever, ever going to happen, uh, to me anyway, certainly, is to nail an earthquake prediction. Very minimal consequence. Um, but anyway, so I want to close with a couple, couple of thoughts. Um, one is from Winston Churchill, which is basically speaks to uh, the reason for why we're doing the monitoring and the hazard, and the hazard mitigation thing, um, which is you really have to you know, sort of understand what we're dealing with when we're talking about volcanoes. And if we don't understand them, then we're going to cause ourselves lots of trouble down the road. But if we do understand them and we're prepared, and that doesn't mean just us, but all of you, in terms of knowing what can happen, what's the likelihood of things happening, how much should I worry, how much should I not worry, um, then uh, we're all going to be better off in the end. And then the, the final quote that I like is um, that civilization exists by geologic consent, subject to change without notice. It's just absolutely brilliant. And uh, with that, thank you for your attention and happy to take questions.